Hello and welcome to our uh, analysis of the war in Ukraine. Uh, this week again with Professor Mangot from the University of Innsbruck. Good morning. Good morning. And as well with my colleague from Czech Republic, Alexander Stipsitz. Good morning. Good morning, dobre rano. Uh, today we will start uh, with uh, a topic uh, that uh, you, Mr. Mangot, may choose. So what do you think is the most important topic at the moment? Uh, surrounding this uh, conflict, war in Ukraine. Well, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, uh, yesterday said that a new phase of the war, or as the Russians call it, a special military operation in Ukraine has started. And what he was referring to is uh, the Russian assault on the uh, remaining territories of the uh, Ukrainian provinces of Luhansk and Donetsk, the so-called Donbass. Uh, Russia has prepared over the past weeks uh, the major offensive to gain territories in the region. Um, and the Ukrainian side has also announced uh, the day before yesterday that the offensive has already started. Maybe we should be more careful uh, what we see are preliminary steps of this major ground offensive on the Russian side using heavy artillery, long range artillery and aircraft to uh, attack uh, Ukrainian defensive positions to kill as many Ukrainian soldiers as possible, to destroy as many military hardware as uh, possible on the Ukrainian side before the Russians will actually start with a ground operation, a massive assault on uh, cities like uh, Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, to, to name uh, two relevant ones that will be uh, in the, the midst or will be at the center of the battles uh, at the beginning of this Donbas offensive. So it will start in, uh, in a couple of days, uh, preliminary steps are already uh, taking place. And um, it's crucial for the Russian political leadership that the Russian forces will be able to get in control of the whole of the Donbass um, in the next weeks, uh, because uh, for, for two reasons, actually, the Russian government has recognized the so-called People's Republics of Lugansk and Donetsk before you know, three days before the war started, and they recognized uh, these republics not in the borders that the separatists at that time controlled, but uh, within the borders of the two Ukrainian provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk. So there's a lot of territory which needs to be uh, conquered and occupied by the Russian forces in order to, as they call it, liberate the whole Donbass uh, from uh, the Ukrainians. Plus, the second uh, importance of this Donbass uh, battle will be the fact that uh, the legitimacy that, uh, you, that the Russian side has sought to give uh, to this military operation uh, was an alleged uh, genocide uh, of the Ukrainian side on the Ru ethnic Russians and Russian speakers in the Donbass. This whole military operation is uh, about uh, stopping this genocide and liberate, as the Russians call it, the Donbass. So this has to be successful because otherwise, uh, with the military defeat of the Russians already uh, in the north of Ukraine, around Kiev, Chernihiv, and, and Kharkiv, um, um, a, a lost battle over the Donbass territories would be a major setback for the Russian leadership, hard to explain. And uh, it would be a real military and political defeat for the Russian side. So the Russians have to be able to conquer the whole of the Donbass. Uh, they will be more cautious, I guess, as they had been in the north of Ukraine, because uh, they want to avoid losing uh, a lot of uh, Russian soldiers and military hardware in this offensive. But ultimately, when the uh, all-out uh, tank battle will start in, the, in these uh, territories of the Donbass, uh, this will be very bloody uh, for both sides, for the Ukrainian and the Russian sides, and a lot of soldiers will die in these uh, in these fightings. Uh, and we have an, an uh, date coming up, uh, May 9th, which is very important in Russia, as it was the defeat of the, of Nazi Germany, and it was said by many uh, experts that uh, Putin has to have a uh, victory he can present until then. Do you think this also plays uh, plays a role in the in this uh, strategy? And uh, can this uh, target this goal to have a victory until then also uh, bring him to using uh, special uh, uh, special weapons like like uh, 
short range atomic uh, tactical weapons? Well, I think the importance of main length has been overstated by many experts. Of course, okay. it's nice for the Russian side to uh, present uh, a military success, uh, the liberation of the whole of the Donbass using the Russian terms. Um, so if that happens, that's, that's perfectly fine to announce on May 9th. But I don't think that the speed of the Russian offensive in the Donbass will actually be tied to this upcoming uh, uh, holiday, festive day in Russia, the, the day of the uh, victory in the great patriotic war, as the Russians call it. So if there is something to announce, if there is some military progress to announce, it will be announced. And it would also fit the Russian narrative that like in 1941, when the Soviet Union had to defend itself against the Nazi assault on the country, uh, Russia today is defending its brother, uh, its brethren in, uh, in Eastern Ukraine against the Nazi government in Kiev. So this would this is a narrative that the Russians have played from the very start. So in this respect, it would also be very welcome if the, there is some presentable military success uh, on that very day. But as I've said, I don't think that the speed of the Russian operation will be dictated by this state if, uh, well, the offensive has not been successful or completed until May 9th, then that's fine as well. So uh, the, the the, the, the schedule of the offensive will be determined based on military necessities and, and uh, possibilities and uh, not by uh, the date May the 9th. May I ask you, how do you see the supply, respectively resupply of Ukraine troops? Uh, this has been, I mean, this will decide the war pretty much. Um, to a degree, the hardware that the Ukrainians uh, are now available to, to have available. This is incredibly difficult and it involves the role of the US to a large degree. How do you see that whole situation? Uh, and I tag the question on, because of the situation with the weapon supplies, do you have a feeling whether or not we are closer to NATO having to get involved or not? Sorry, I'll mute myself because there's a baby in the background. Well, uh, military hardware supplies by Western countries are very, very strong, particularly by countries like the United States, but also by uh, the Polish, by the Dutch, by the Belgians. Uh, while the Germans are still contemplating whether they will send heavy weapons to, to Ukraine. For this battle uh, on the Donbass uh, region, of course, it will be important uh, that Ukraine receives uh, heavy weaponry from the West, meaning tanks, meaning anti-aircraft missiles, long-range artillery. Otherwise, they will not, uh, will not prevail in, uh, in the all-out tank battle over, over the region. So uh, this, for the Ukrainian side, seen from the Ukrainian side, this Western support is essential. Uh, the German government has been criticized very strongly, particularly Chancellor Olaf Scholz, for not showing leadership and not being uh, showing resolve. Uh, I would be rather careful about that, or at least a, a bit more, uh, um, well, let's say more sober, because uh, you can have full resolve and do the wrong thing, and you can lead in the wrong direction. So it's not important if there's leadership and resolve on the part of the German government, but the relevance is, is the German government doing the right thing, like the other Western nations supplying military hardware. And here the question is, and the military experts are divided on the question, will the, uh, uh, the uh, offer uh, and the shipment of military hardware to Ukraine make a difference on the battlefield, enabling the Ukrainian army to, to uh, keep the Russians at bay, to uh, make it impossible for the Russians to occupy the whole of the Donbass, then it does make sense if once on the Ukrainian side, it makes then sense to send he uh, heavy military hardware. If it, however, does not make uh, a difference at the end of the day, namely that uh, Ukraine will, uh, despite uh, Western weapons, finally uh, suffer a, a defeat by the Russian forces in the Donbass, then sending this heavy military hardware is only prolonging the war and also only prolonging the misery and the suffering 
uh, of the Ukrainian side. So this is something for the military experts to decide. And as I've said, they are divided on whether uh, heavy weaponry will enable Ukrainians to hold uh, the Russians at bay. Um, I myself, I'm not a military expert and cannot make a decision on it, but it is the answer to this question that is relevant for the decision to send arms, heavy arms or not. Do you think that the uh, dependency on Russian gas is also holding Germany back to sending uh, the heavy weaponry? It may be an argument, yes, of course, but I don't think that the Russians at the moment have any interest in uh, interrupting gas and all supplies to its European customers. It's a major resource of revenue, of income for the Russian side. So what is more likely, uh, which doesn't mean it's very likely, but what is more likely is that we will have an oil embargo by the European Union on, on Russia, uh, maybe not a gas embargo uh, at the same time, maybe a little bit later. So uh, it's more, the, the, the threat of interrupted gas supplies is more uh, based on a major Western embargo that on the Russian decision to interrupt supplies. So I don't think it's a major argument for the German side to be uh, reluctant and careful. Uh, but we also have to say, of course, uh, the German coalition government is very much divided on the issue. The Germans and uh, the, the Greens, sorry, and the Liberals are pushing for sending tanks and other military hardware to Ukraine, whereas uh, the Social Democrats with its Chancellor Olaf Scholz are quite reluctant and skeptical about uh, the salience of such a decision. Um, let, me, let me just come in here with a question about news that's fairly recent from this morning. Um, Moscow has apparently started to threaten Moldavia uh, um, um, yeah, Moldavia over the Transnistrian situation, and people are fearing anyway an expansion of the war activities. Um, Putin certainly is with his back against the wall. Unless he's toppled, he will have to continue fighting till a victory. That's the, of some sort. That's what I think. Uh, how, how likely do you think this conflict uh, may expand to neighboring countries uh, of Ukraine? Well, it very much depends on how the uh, battle in, in the Donbass will proceed. If the Russians will be successful, only optimists are, are arguing that then Russia will stop uh, the military assault on Ukraine. Others say, emboldened by a victory in the Donbass, will make Russians move uh, throughout the, the south and southeast of Ukraine up to the river Dnieper, which uh, is roughly is in the mid in the middle of, of Ukraine, and they argue if a battle in the Donbas will be successful, we might see that Russians will try to seize the city of Mykolaiv, which is a necessity in order to attack, to attack the major Ukrainian port of Odessa. And if the Russians will do that, then of course they will try to conquer all the territories that lead up, that leads up to the Transnistrian Republic, a separatist entity of the Republic of Moldova, east of the Dniester uh, River. So to have a land bridge to this uh, separatist region, which only survives based on Russian support. So it's possible that there will be such a link up if everything goes well with the Russian military operations. I don't think that we will have uh, an attack by Russia on Moldova proper. So the remaining territories of Moldova to the west of the river Dniester. So um, at most we will see uh, establishing a land bridge to the Transnistrian separatist region, but no military assault on the rest of Moldova, which of course legally is an assault on Moldova because uh, internationally the uh, region of Transnistria is recognized as a sovereign part of the Republic of Moldova. Any follow-up? Um, the follow-up, I would like, I would like, <laughs> tons, tons, God, um, lots of things uh, to ask. Um, but I would like to go into Moscow, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, um, as I'm, I'm going around the news in three languages every day, um, I find it increasingly difficult to discern any reliable information out of Russia uh, and discern individually whether it's this propaganda or whether it's solid information. How, what is your information coming out of, of Moscow, so to speak? There's been some billionaire who has apparently today criticized the war. 
um, quite an influential one. Certainly there's some people unhappy, a lot of people still are, are totally behind Putin, but I couldn't say, I certainly can't say. Uh, tell us a little bit what your information is. How is it going in Russia? How is the war being perceived? And do we see any chance on the horizon for Putin's um, reign to come to a, to a close? Well, the majority of the Russian population is not able to have verified information about, what, uh, about what's really going on in Ukraine. Uh, a majority is dependent on information by the state media. And they, of course, don't call it a war, not an invasion, but a special military operation. And they don't actually uh, speak a lot about uh, Russia's, uh, Russia's defeat. So the loss of hardware, like the uh, flagship, the missile cruiser Moskva, which sank a couple of days ago, after the Ukrainian uh, attack on, on this flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. So there is not an information blackout, but the information that is transmitted via, via state media is very much uh, uh, biased and selected, and uh, in many cases is pure propaganda. There are, of course, still telegram channels or some uh, channels on other social media which can be used by Russians who do not want to rely on state television. Uh, by these channels, they can gain information about uh, the reality of, of the war, but this is only a minority of the Russian population. As far as I'm concerned, of course, I have to be careful with any Russian information that I am uh, using, uh, be it uh, state media, of course, very, very careful about reports on state media, but also reports from other uh, newspapers and uh, news agencies and uh, social media channels uh, have to be uh, assessed very, very carefully, whether it's true, whether it's propaganda by the regime, whether it's propaganda by the opposition. So we have to be very careful with any news about uh, Ukraine from the Russian side. But of course, I also do have an extensive network to Russian colleagues, to Russian politicians, diplomats, and the like to get information uh, from so-called anonymous sources to get a clearer picture on how the Russians perceive the war and what the next steps of the Russian side will be. So in such a situation, it's of course important that you have a lot of personal contacts, uh, contacts you have great trust in, uh, that you believe in, and uh, take the information you get from conversations with these people to assess uh, the situation. However, I would also say we need to be careful about Western and Ukrainian reports about the war. Uh, this is an information war as much as a war on the battlefield. So we, of course, get a lot of information that is biased from the Western side and from the Ukrainian side as well, which is not surprising. But we have to say that we have to be careful about any information of any source during uh, such a wartime period. And it makes uh, work a little bit more difficult than usual. Uh, Austrian Chancellor Nehammer was in Moscow not long ago, and you were one of the strongest uh, criticizers of this trip to Moscow. And in the, as we spoke before, before we uh, began with the interview, you told me that you got quite a shitstorm for criticizing him. So what is, what are your, uh, your main reasons for your opinion that it was a, a mistake to go to Russia now? Well, when news broke out that uh, Chancellor Neham will visit uh, Vladimir Putin the next day, uh, I first of all uh, warned that the Russian side might use the video footage or pictures from this meeting for propaganda. Which happened. Which actually the Austrian side uh, avoided uh, because they could convince, obviously, the Russian side not to have any video footage, not, not even a single picture of the meeting between Putin and Nehama. So this concern on my side, which was a very valid concern, uh, did not actually materialize because we had no coverage, no video coverage of the meeting. However, uh, the state media still used the visit by the Austrian Chancellor to argue that uh, uh, just see, Russia is not isolated, Putin is not isolated, but uh, a chief of government, the head of government of EU countries coming to Moscow to talk to Vladimir Putin, which no other EU country has done since the war broke out. So in this respect, Russian propaganda worked uh, very well, um, trying or helping Putin to argue well, they are coming to me, they are still talking to me. So I'm not a pariah that Western media uh, try uh, to make myself and Western governments try to make myself. So in this respect, the, uh, the, uh, 
the visit was uh, was a mistake. And uh, secondly, it was a mistake because uh, the expectation by Chancellor Nehammer that he will be able to convince Vladimir Putin about the necessity of humanitarian corridors from embattled cities, or even about the necessity of a truce, of, of a ceasefire, uh, these efforts that uh, Nehama said were real efforts of his visit, uh, these efforts were illusionary uh, to reach from the very start. And of course, there was no result, no positive outcome of these talks with Vladimir Putin. So actually, in this respect, the visit was uh, just, just useless and it should have been avoided. Well, Chancellor Nehama and his advisors argue that uh, it was important that someone from the West tells Putin into his face about the war crimes that needs to be that need to be investigated about the barbarity of uh, the russian forces operating in ukraine however i don't think that uh, even if nehama has done so we don't know because we don't have any official statements about what uh, was talked uh, about between the two even if nehama said this this will have had no impression on, on vladimir putin and nehama's uh, uh, suggestion that he will uh, try to get the Russian cooperation on uh, investigating war crimes, like in Bucha, uh, a suburb of Kiev. Uh, all these uh, announcements were just illusionary and self-aggrandizement, I would say, and too great esteem of oneself, uh, oneself's importance and relevance. So all in all, I don't think that this visit was useful, it was uh, useless, with no results, but with uh, with propaganda gains for the Russian side. So if I had been an advisor of the chancellor, I would have recommended him not to do so. If one of the reasons was uh, to gain public support in Austria, then that's a different story. Because of course, such a visit by the chancellor of a neutral country can be sold to the public as an active policy of neutrality, that Austria is using its neutral status to mediate and that, I guess, also looking at uh, the reactions I've received to my uh, interview criticizing Nehammer, uh, this uh, this um, aspect of the visit was very much uh, was very well received by the Austrian public. So, if the Chancellor went to Moscow also, or even exclusively for domestic political reasons, then in this regard it was a success, but not a foreign policy success, but a foreign policy mistake. Well, considering that he had to deflect uh, from an internal little scandal, which is um, of the more humorous kind, I certainly agree with you. Uh, but as you mentioned, a European leader albeit of a very small nation, uh, let's stay maybe with the European Union for a second. Apparently, the Ukraine is now on the fast track. Uh, according to van der Leyen, uh, that there is movement uh, concerning the membership of Ukraine to the European Union. That's, that's one side concerning the European Union. Um, and then I want to tag on immediately the question of Finland and Sweden um, uh, eyeing NATO membership. So how do you see the positioning of the EU and the NATO in this context vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Because certainly it signals under Putin, there will not be a communicative future with Russia. How do you view these positionings that are going on and, and will uh, decide decades of, of, of politics? Well, the, the West is united, the US, NATO, the European Union, that there will be no business as usual as long as Vladimir Putin stays in power. And actually, we cannot think of Putin visiting any Western country uh, in the years to come because he has, uh, he's uh, considered a war criminal. The US president has called him a war criminal. Uh, Western nations are trying to uh, investigate war crimes and bring those responsible for them to justice in The Hague at the International Criminal Tribunal. So definitely there won't be uh, an unfreezing of relations between Russia and the West as long as Putin is in power. That's definite. And we don't know how long Putin will stay in power. If he runs in the 2024 presidential elections again, which is very likely, he will be elected until 2030 uh, if he uh, doesn't die before uh, that date. So he may be the president of Russia for a very long time, which would mean a long term freeze in the relations between the West and, and the Russian side. This uh, posture by von der Leyen that Ukraine uh, should have uh, a future of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, membership of the European Union is somewhat uh, unprofessional, I think. Um, yes, the Ukrainian side has stated that it has answered all the questions in the questionnaire from the European Commission on, uh, on the, the accession negotiations to the European Union. But how serious is it to uh, claim that all the questions have been suffi sufficiently answered by the Ukrainian side within a period of 10 days, which other candidate countries cost more than more than a year or even more. Um, but um, if the oh, answers are now uh, submitted to the European Commission, which they already have been, then uh, it's for the European Union Council to decide whether to give uh, uh, Ukraine the status of a, a membership country, the status of a candidate for membership in the European Union, to be precise. Uh, this could happen in June. However, I would call it very premature to do so because uh, if, even if we declare now or if we make uh, the Ukraine a candidate country now, negotiations about actual membership will take years, if not decades. So in, 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 a, in sort of a, a way, this is, a, this is an illusionary path for the Ukrainian side. All these commitments now made by European permission, uh, politicians or commission people that Ukraine will become a member of the European Union is a political, is a political message uh, which actually uh, cannot hold ground in reality because it will take, as I've said, many years, if not more than a decade for Ukraine to be ready for joining the European Union. Union. So creating these illusions now is something which I don't think is very professional, but others may, might, have, might have a different opinion. Well, Sweden and Finland, Finland uh, most likely will uh, um, in the forthcoming weeks ask for uh, accession to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to NATO. And it is expected that already the NATO uh, North Atlantic Council meeting on the level of heads of government and state in June will answer positively to these requests. So uh, these two countries, Finland and Sweden, are definitely on a fast track to NATO membership. Yeah, but even if, the, uh, if NATO invites the two countries to join the military alliance in June, it will take some time. But because before the countries can really accede to, uh, to NATO, all the parliaments of the 30 NATO member countries have to ratify uh, the documents. This will take some time. Of course, the process will be speeded up, but it will take some months before these countries will join NATO. But it's most likely that they will. A majority of the populations in both countries are now, uh, because of the war in Ukraine, in support of NATO membership, which has been which has had not been the case before that. So actually Russia has created a, a very unfortunate development for itself by launching this war of aggression. Uh, but NATO will be uh, significantly strengthened because both Sweden and Finland have very strong armies. Both of these armies have already cooperated with NATO forces for, uh, uh, for many years already, despite not being former members of the Alliance. So this will strengthen the military capabilities of NATO and actually will uh, uh, double the, the, uh, uh, the length of the borders that NATO will have with the Russian Federation uh, from the current state of affairs. Concerning the Ukraine EU membership, I hope Europe is not doing the same mistake as they did with, for example, Turkey, to tell them like 20 years ago they can be a member of the, Ukra of, of the European Union and then nothing really happened. So I hope they're not making the same mistake now with Ukraine. Um, uh, we just had uh, elections in Hungary. Last week we had a colleague here from Hungary which we spoke about the Hungarian elections. And after Orban's victory, uh, we saw him going back to a closer relationship to Putin because before he supported uh, sanctions against Russia. But now it seems like he's trying to get back into Putin's lap, or however we will say. And also uh, in Serbia, we had presidential elections and they're also a pro-Russian pro candidate. Yeah, that was the right word, thank you, uh, won the election. So uh, what do you think will happen with either uh, Hungary within the European Union and also with Serbia without, but with uh, they of course have the goal to change the European Union sooner or later? 
So what will happen in these two countries, you think? Well, uh, the victory of Orban, another victory of Orban in Hungary is actually a major success for, for the Russians. Uh, Orban is an asset for the Russians in as far as uh, Orban has intensified energy cooperation with the Russians, not just in the gas and oil sector, but also in the nuclear sector. And uh, the, the Hungarian government has announced that it will oppose embargoes on Russian oil and gas uh, in the European Union. Well, if they really stick to this position and do not submit uh, to the pressure that will be uh, put on the Hungarian government not to do so, but if they continue or if they stick to this position, uh, to boycott an embargo, then there will be no embargo because sanctions have to be imposed uh, within the framework of the European Union on a consensual basis. So every membership has to has to support sanctions. So um, if Hungary uh, is able and willing to resist the pressure from other EU countries and the United States uh, to agree to an oil and gas embargo, then this will be, of course, a major success for the, for the Russian side. Besides, uh, relations between the Orban government and the Ukrainian government are very poor, have been for a couple of years already, based on the language, lo language law that was passed in Ukraine a couple of years ago, which makes it dif more difficult for uh, ethnic minorities to use their mother language uh, in various circumstances, which does not only affect the Russian uh, ethnic minority, uh, in Ukraine, but also, uh, like other minorities, the Hungarian minority in Transcarpathia uh, in, in the west of Ukraine. And over this, re the relations had been strained between Hungary and Ukraine even before the war started, and, and these negative and poor relations have uh, continued uh, uh, also uh, during the last two months. So in this respect, Hungary is important. Serbia has been, uh, well, the, the victory of Vucic in, in Serbia, of course, is important for Russia. Uh, he is very Russia friendly. However, there's a, a deal of disappointment uh, uh, in Moscow about uh, Serbia because in uh, the United Nations General Assembly, Serbia has voted yes on a resolution condemning the Russian attack, the Russian invasion. So the Russians would have clearly expected Serbia uh, to at least abstain. Uh, they would have been satisfied if they had abstained, but they voted for this resolution. This was not well, very well received in Moscow. But the Serbian government, of course, is under strong pressure. They want to join the European Union, which will also take a very long time, but they want to join the European Union. And European politicians have made it clear to Serbia if they want to keep uh, uh, the prospect of membership in the EU alive, they have to actually uh, converge their foreign policy towards Russia with the EU policy towards Russia, which mean that means that Serbia will have to impose the sanctions that the EU has uh, imposed on the Russians, uh, which the Serbians have not yet done so, but it remains to be seen whether Vucic will be strong enough to resist this Western pressure. Uh, it seems that he realizes that he can't have it both good relations with Russia and uh, uh, a prospect of membership in the European Union. Let, let me hit you with a biggie at the end. Quite not only Three months ago, we unfortunately quite accurately predicted that there would be a war. Uh, considering the way the war is going, I think we all agree Putin cannot withdraw without some kind of, of feasible victory. The Ukrainians uh, definitely cannot um, um, stop the war. So, sorry, sorry, it's the baby. Uh, um, are we quagmired in a war that will last for years going back of and forth? Or do you see a scenario where we can finish uh, this war by, let's say, autumn? Well, it, it very much depends on how the battle over the Donbass will unfold, if the Russians will be successful. Uh, the most optimistic scenario for the Ukrainian side is that Russians, after having seized the whole of the Donbass, uh, will be satisfied with their gains in the south of Ukraine and in the east of Ukraine and then simply stop uh, other offensives against other regions of Ukraine. That's the most optimistic scenario, which is by far not guaranteed, but it's not even guaranteed that the Russians will be able to occupy the Donbass. Um, 
Uh, others say and argue that uh, if the Russians are successful in the east of Ukraine, in the Donbass, they will be emboldened to go, f uh, go even uh, further and uh, try to capture and, and occupy all territories of Ukraine. This cannot be ruled out, uh, of course. But even if the Russians would stop at the borders of the Donbass and the, the, the borders of the southern regions they now control by their military forces, Ukraine will definitely not accept it and will continue to fight. Uh, so what we will see is an ongoing war, maybe on a lower level, uh, lower intensity war. But we cannot expect uh, that we will find a peace solution uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine, if the Russians occupy and control the whole of the Donbass and southern Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainians will not give in. Uh, they will not actually give up, so to speak. Um, they will continue with their resistance, more or less intense, depending on Western uh, weaponry that they receive. So I don't think that we will uh, see a definite end of the uh, military hostilities in Ukraine anytime soon. Maybe we'll see an end of the intensive phase of the war operations in a couple of months, but for the next months we will see a continuation of this war. Okay, on this not so very optimistic, but of course realistic picture, I think we can uh, close for today. Thank you again for your expertise. Thanks, and, and we will be back soon. Thank you. All the best.